Dr. Art Ong is a man of many talents and very, very distinguished, and he has many achievements under his belt. You cannot imagine, okay, how, how lateral uh, thinking he is and how diverse his talents are. He was educated at Cambridge University, okay, and he not only has one. Hello. Yes, he not only has one PhD, he has two. So he has one doctorate in communications from the Imperial College of London and another PhD from, in education from Chulalongkorn Kong University. And then after that, what did he do? <laughs> he went to work at NASA. NASA, as a scientist in NASA on the Viking Space Project. How many people go on to get two PhDs in very diverse fields and suddenly end up in NASA? <laughs> Dr. Art Ong, okay? Where he designed automatic lending, uh, automatic lending device. And he was the expert in Thailand's National Research Council, advising on the use of rockets in artificial rainmaking. He has been involved as a lecturer, a researcher and administrator at universities and institutes in Thailand. And he has been honoured as Thailand's top scientist for making useful inventions. He has been elected to the Thai Parliament and Senate and participated in various capacities in the field of education and science and technology. However, Dr. Ats Ong's passion is not to only to sit on all these prestigious boards. His passion has been in the teaching and propagation of human values. He has tirelessly trained teachers in human values education in many, many continents. And he has written books on various aspects of human values. He has been honoured for his work countless number of times as a scientist as, and as a philosopher. And he has received many knighthoods in Thailand. So he's a knight also, okay? <laughs> and today, Dr. Ad Ong is the founder and director of the Satya Sai School in Thailand, a residential school. It's a very interesting school that is self-sufficient in food, and in energy, where students follow a human set value centered curriculum and live by ecologically friendly principles. The school aims to raise the consciousness of students so that they become economically productive human beings of good character with high standards of morality and ethics, active in alleviating social and environmental distress. Now, now he's my idol. Isn't it? Isn't it fantastic? Let's give, our, give him a very, very warm round of applause. Okay. Dr. Art Ong Jumzai Na Ayuda, a man who is eminently qualified to talk on today's topic. Education for human values for a better world. Dr. Art Ong, please. Your Excellency, Member Parliament, Sis Joyce, and dear respected friends, I'm very, very happy that I could be here again and talk to all of you about education for human values for a better world. So, since we only have one hour, I will start straight away. We live in this world, the only world that we have. We can't go and live on, uh, on other planets. We cannot go to Mercury. There's no atmosphere and it's very hot. We can't go to Venus. Because there, the temperature is over 600 degrees Celsius at the surface. So, 
This is the only world that we can live in. We can't go to Mars as yet, although this is something that we are looking at. Scientists are working on this. I helped to land a spacecraft there and discovered that, well, it's not so bad. There's no oxygen, only carbon dioxide, but the temperature is not too cold. At the equator, it's minus 31 degrees Celsius. It's cold, but I went to Moscow once for a conference and the temperature was minus 35, much colder than uh, Mars. Of course, the North Pole, South Pole of Mars, you, you have a lot of um, ice that is from carbon dioxide becoming ice. It's very cold. Anyway, type, uh, people in our world we like to uh, create global warming. So all we need to do is to go to Mars, create global warming, then the temperature will rise and we can live there because we can plant trees. They love carbon dioxide. They will grow quickly and they will start to give out oxygen. So after a while we could live there. But it'll be another hundred years or so before we can really migrate over to Mars. So in the meantime, we have to learn to live together in this world. This is our only home. We can't go anywhere else at the moment. So we have to learn to live together as one big family in the same house. So how are we going to do that? Well, first of all, we all got to learn to have a lot of peace. We got to be peaceful. We got to be peaceful with one another. Peaceful with oneself. How to do that? Well, it's very easy because we say all the time, I want peace. How to get peace? Well, you don't have to think so much because it's already the answer is already in these words I want peace if you only want peace and you don't want anything else all you need to do is to get rid of two words the word I the word want then you only have peace so that is a solution get rid of the I the I is our ego you know, people say bad things at us. They're not doing anything to us. They're just say, using bad words. But it touch our ego, so we become angry and upset. But scientifically, and we're going to be scientists listening today, we're going to analyze everything. What is coming to our ears? Well, it's only vibration of air. It's oxygen, nitrogen, carbon dioxide vibrating into our ears. So, they're not doing anything to us. They're not hurting us in any way. It's only vibration of air coming into our ears. So all we need to do is smile. Don't get upset with vibration of air. They're not hurting us in any way. But it's because of our ego, because of our attachment to the I, that we become angry. Get rid of that attachment. Then there's nothing that can be hurt. Okay? So get rid of the I. Don't compare yourself with others. Sometimes we become jealous because we compare ourselves with others. Get rid of the I, then there's no comparison. We'll be very peaceful very happy. The second word we got to get rid of is the word want. In this day and age, the whole world, except for one country, have decided to use GNP, Gross National Product, as a way to measure progress. Well, what does that mean? It means we have to produce a lot of goods. 
when we produce a lot of goods, we have to sell a lot of goods. So if we have to sell a lot of, lot of goods, we have to create desires in everybody. We have to try to advertise our products. We've got to get people to want our products, buy our products. And so everybody has more and more desire, more wants in life. And the more want you have, the more problem that you will have also. Because you cannot satisfy everything that you want. So the more want, the more unhappiness. Less want, less unhappiness. No want, no unhappiness. So we have to re learn to reduce our desire. Gradually get rid of our desire. You know, there's only one country in the world that have decided not to use GNP as the measurement for progress. And that is Bhutan. You know, Bhutan, they measure the progress with GNH, Gross National Happiness. When people are happy, they said, that's the real progress. So the more people who are happy, the more progress is the country is proceeding in that direction. So I actually helped Bhutan. I went there and trained all of their teachers, the whole country, because they want to have a new system of education that will bring about happiness for everyone. So I was invited by the Minister of Education to go and train all the teachers, the whole country. I went there eight times and now the whole country has been trained and they've sent over 70 people, teachers, to come and stay in our Satya Sai school in Thailand, okay? So they've been staying there, they've been living there for, for quite some time and they learned everything from us and took it back to their country. So this is the secret. I want peace. You want peace only, nothing else. Get rid of the I, get rid of the want. And so now I like to talk about the education process. How we learn. This is so important for all of us to understand. Okay? All teachers should know how to teach children. All the children should know, and all of us, we are all learners. Nobody is not learning. We are all learning. UNESCO says that learning is a lifelong process. We have to learn and learn and learn all through our lives. You know, I had to learn a lot, even at the age of 60, 70, I still have to learn and learn and learn, not stopping, okay? So we are all learners. So, how do we learn? Please, don't follow the West. The West, they said, you've got to use brain-based learning. Brain is most important. Well, let us not follow their examples. The brain is born when we, be, we are baby in the, with the mother, okay? And then it gradu gradually uh, starts to develop and increase the number, okay, and it's fully developed after you're about 20 years or so, and after that some of the cells in the brain start to die. You know, they said that when uh, you are my age, already 300 million cells in the brain has died. Well, I'm not worried because, I, ha you know, all of us, we have over 100,000 million cells in the brain. So if 300 million should die, that's only a small percentage. So don't worry about it. I can still use my brain. I can still do everything. Okay? So we're all learners. I'm li still learning at this age. Okay? Well over 70, I'm still learning and learning all the time. So let's see how we learn. Let us use the mind and not the brain. The mind is far more important than the brain. So let's start with the conscious mind. 
The conscious mind is where the all understanding takes place. Okay, we have to use this conscious mind. And in order to learn, we have to have interaction with the outside world. We take in information from outside by using our five senses. Okay, so we use our ears to hear, our eyes to see, and so on. And at the same time, we store all the information in our subconscious mind. So the subconscious mind is very important. It is the part where we store everything. But it's far greater than the memory in a computer. Memory in the computer is limited, but our subconscious mind is unlimited. You can learn and learn and learn and put all the information in there. It's never lost. It has not gone anywhere. It's always there for us to retrieve. Okay, but we have to learn to retrieve it. Okay, in order to remember, you have to bring information from the subconscious to the conscious. And we'll see how we're going to do that. Okay, so the subconscious contain everything in our past. And you'll be surprised. There's so much information kept in there. So now, let us look at our five senses. You know, there was once a king who had five wives. Well, each wife would come along and demand something from the king. I want this. I saw something beautiful. I need it. I want it. You must give it to me. So, the king, who is afraid of his wives, he has to comply with everything. But he finds no peace because he has five wives. And all the wives are demanding everything from the king. They come along and they ask for this and that all the time. And the king has to comply. He's afraid of his wives. He's very unhappy. So he went to see his cabinet ministers who are all male. Help me, tell me, advise me how I, I can live without having to be afraid of my wives. So the ministers who are all male, they said, sorry, Sai, we're all afraid of our wives. So they made a plan. We're going to invite all the male population for a big meeting. On that day, We'll put up a tent for those who are afraid of their wives and another tent for those who are not afraid of their wives. In this way, we'll go to the tent for those who are not afraid and then we'll get their advice. So when the time came, well, the tent for those who are afraid is filled up very quickly with the population, whereas the tent for those who are not afraid, nobody came. So. The king was very unhappy. Are there no men in this country who's not afraid of their wives? Well, finally one man did come to the tent for those who are not afraid. The king immediately rushed to that tent and welcomed the man and said, Tell me your secret. How is it that you're not afraid of your wives? Well, the man said, Sorry, sire, but I'm also afraid of my wife. So the king said, then how come you come to this tent? You've got to go to the other tent. So this man said, sorry, sire, I will not go. You can punish me, you can do whatever you like, but I will not go to the other tent. Why? Why not? Why won't you go? Well, my wife told me to come to this tent. <laughs> so we are all the king. The five wives are the five senses. Our eye sees something, it starts to make demand on us. Oh, I want this, I want that. And the ear, same thing, receives good sound, beautiful sound. Oh, I want audio equipment, I need this, I need that. We're making all kinds of demands on us. So, we got to become the king. We have to control the five senses. This is very necessary if we want to live a peaceful life. So, 
Let's look at how we should control our five senses. We need to understand first the five senses, their function. We use the eyes to see. We bring light into our eyes. Sometimes we see something and we said, Ah, oh, that's bad. How come you can see bad? Let's be scientists. Okay? Let's, uh, let us understand what is going on. We say we see something bad. How come you can see something bad? What is it that is entering our eyes? Well, scientists will say it's light. What is light? Light is vibration of electrical field, magnetic field. Okay? So it's electromagnetic field that is entering our eyes. So we say, that's bad. Well, let's analyze it. If it's electromagnetic energy, okay, which it is, okay, electrical field, magnetic field at right angles to each other, is it the electrical field that is making us angry? Or is it the magnetic field or, or the electrical field? Well, scientists will say neither. Electrical field is only vibration of electricity, it's, it's not creating any problem for us. Magnetic field does not make us angry at all. So nothing will make us angry. So how come we become angry? Well, look at the way you point your fingers. That's bad! Notice there are three fingers pointing back at you. You are bad. That's why you see bad. Otherwise you won't see bad. Okay? So realize that there's something in our own mind that is making us seeing bad. Okay? Look at our ears. Somebody is swearing at us. Why do we become angry? What is entering our ears? Well, it's sound. Sound is vibration of air consisting of uh, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon dioxide. Ask any scientist, is it the oxygen that makes us angry? They say, no, 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 no. That doesn't make us angry. Nitrogen? No, 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 no. Carbon dioxide? No, 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 no. So nothing can make us angry. It's only vibration of air. Okay? So that is something that we really need to understand. And we have to understand that it is the process that we use to interpret information. You know, I went to Paris when I was only nine years old, long, long time ago. It was straight after the World War II. I was there. And the French boys came to talk to me and I didn't understand a single word, I just smiled. They become upset, they want to talk to me and I don't talk to them. So they became angry, they start to swear at me all the time. And then I smiled and smiled because I did not understand a single word. I could not translate the meaning of those swear words. So nothing could upset me. But after one month, I started to understand that they were swearing at me. Then I became very upset. I became very angry. Okay? Because I translated, I gave some meaning to those vibration of air. So this is the problem that we have. We translate information all the time. And how we translate? Well, we use information that we keep that we have received previously, we store it in our subconscious, we draw that out and compare with what has come in. And we say, ah, I understand, because we already stored something. Like in France, after one month, I was able to understand that these were swear words. So I could start to uh, translate the meaning, give the meaning to the swear words, then I became upset, I became angry with the French boys, I boxed them and uh, taught them a lot of lessons using Thai kickboxing. They couldn't beat me at all. So, this is very important. We translate information. So, it depends on what we have put into our subconscious. 
Nowadays, our children, they see television programs. There's a lot of violence on television. And you have plays and you have all kinds of dramas full of action. And mostly they're, they're negative action. Okay? So people watch all this. They put all this information into the subconscious. Then one day they bring it out, translate the meaning, give the meaning to whatever we hear and they start to become violent. So you have to understand that our true enemies are now within all of us. Anger, lust, envy, greed, pride, hatred, attachment, fear and anxiety. It's all put into our subconscious. So if we really understand that, that everything, a child, depends on what we have put into their subconscious. So now it's a job of the teachers okay, to get children to think good, hear good, see good all the time. We bring in human values into everything we teach, okay, always helping children to think good things all the time, hear good things all the time. All this will then be put into the subconscious. It becomes a program within the child. Just as the computer, when we print something, immediately it will draw information from the subconscious in order to translate the meaning. Okay? Then the computer understands if there's something similar, then it sends that to the um, the, 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 the screen of the computer, then we understand. Okay? So it's the same process. We have to store information in our subconscious, which is our memory. We draw that information out to compare with whatever is sent to us. So it's necessary in schools, for our children, in our home, that we put in a lot of positive thinking, a lot of good actions, human values, into everything that we teach. So parents are very necessary, good parents are very necessary for children, good teachers, very necessary, where we can integrate everything, put in values in everything that we teach all the time. Okay? Now, when we do this, children start to have positive thinking, and this is very important. We want the children to become a good person. We have to put in a lot of positive thoughts, positive information. So all the time, when you teach mathematics, when you teach science, and you, you, we know that Singapore wants to really progress um, in many, many fields. So it's our job as a teacher, as parents, to integrate values into all subjects, all the time. Okay? So for example, you have 32 divided by 8. What does that equal to? Well, uh, normally in school we teach children to learn the multiplication table, 8, 1 is 8, 8, 2 is 16, 8, 3 is 24, 8, 4 is 32. So you get the answer. But the children will become clever only, but not filled with human values. We want them to be a good citizen. So as teachers, we got to integrate values into all subjects. Okay? So... 32 divided by 8. Well, all we need to do is to put in values. So, a child, daughter, with her mother, went to the market. The, ma the mother loves the daughter so much, she decided to buy 32 fruits for her child, favorite fruit for the child, 32 of them. And then she went back home. Seven of her friends came to see her. And she remembered the child, remembered that the teacher has taught us to learn to share, to learn to give. So we're going to share the 32 fruit with our friends. 
So how many should we give to each person? The seven friends and ourselves making eight people. Okay, so we share the fruits amongst eight people. So it's 32 divided by eight. But we already put in a lot of values. Oh, love of our mother. The mother is so great, you know, giving us so many things. Oh, teacher, wonderful teachers, teaching us values. Oh, I'll do what the teachers have taught us. And we'll learn to give. We're going to give. We're going to divide the fruits into eight portions and we'll give it to everybody. So it's 32 divided by eight. But we put in a lot of values. And that's what we have to do in all of our classes. Okay? Whatever we teach, fill it with values, even negative things. For example, we talk about World War II. It, we have to tell, we have to teach the children about Hitler, how he killed the Jews, six million Jews were killed in gas chambers, okay? Well, uh, the reason is because the Jews, they control the economy of the country. So, Hitler decided to take a, a shortcut, kill them out, kill, kill them off, and then um, he can install the Germans to go and take their positions instead. So, if you just teach history in this way, we are putting in ideas that we get rid of our opponent, kill them up, kill them off, okay? Then we'll take over their positions. And that is very negative. We don't want to do that. So, when you teach something that is negative, try to bring out something positive out of it. So, I get my children to think, if you were... Hitler and the Jews are controlling the economy there's really wonderful people who knows all about economy what should we do okay if we were Hitler at that time well I get the children to go out and discuss it amongst themselves then come back and report and they came back and they said well if the Jews are so clever Let's make them professors in the university. Then we'll go and learn from them and very quickly we'll absorb everything and we'll be very clever like the Jews, very quickly. No point killing them off because their knowledge will be gone as well. Okay, so they came up with positive values. So don't teach just history. We've got to get the children to think about it, whether it's good or not whether it's worthwhile, whether it's, uh, we have something to learn from it or not. So that's the way we should teach everything. Science contains a lot of values all the time. You go out into the sunlight and then you get the children to think. Are you receiving equally the sunlight from the sun? They said, yes, it's all equal. There's no discrimination. No, no discrimination. And does the sun charge us any money for the heat, for the light that we receive? No, it's free. Everything is free. So from science, gradually we teach the children, let's be like the sun, giving freely with no discrimination, no charge. Okay? Learn to serve everyone, help everyone all the time. So. That's the way we should teach our children. However, the negative things in the world are outweighs the good things in the world. Okay, we have a lot of problems through television, through movies and so on, a lot of negativity. So the children are pulled down all the time. Teachers may help to raise the consciousness, but we are fighting a losing battle, okay, unless we really know the secret. And that is We've got to raise the consciousness of the children. If you don't raise the consciousness, then we lose, okay, the battle in the world. So what we do, we raise the consciousness higher and higher, okay, and then they will start to be in contact with the super conscious mind. We have three levels of consciousness, the subconscious, the conscious, and the superconscious, okay, the subconscious contain all past inf information. That is our memory. The conscious is what we are aware of. 
and the superconscious is the person who knows everything within ourselves. You know, we are not just ordinary human beings, but we have something that will give us, give us a lot of knowledge, information. We know a lot of things. It's stored, it's not stored, but it's there all the time in our super conscious mind. All we need to do is to raise the consciousness higher and higher all the time. And we do this with our children, okay? Um, and intuition will start here. The children in the Satchasai school, they learn to pray, they learn to sit in meditation, they learn to raise their consciousness higher. And you can do this with any religion, okay? All religions, they all learn to calm the mind, to think about God, to think about the Buddha, to think about good things all the time. So our children, they learn to sit still. They pray. They start to sit in meditation. And you know, every morning, six o'clock in the morning, they're in the prayer room, they're sitting and praying and sitting in meditation. Then I tell them a good story every day, okay, on human values. They listen to that. They're very happy with it. Then we sing songs, okay, human value songs together, okay. Every morning we do that. And every hour on the hour, we start with some prayers and meditation, a short one, just five minutes. So they learn to practice every hour. And even before going to bed, they will have their own prayers and meditation in their dormitory. It's a boarding school. Okay? So they learn to raise the consciousness higher and higher all the time. Little children and big children, they all learn this, learn to sit still, calm their mind down. And here is an experiment done uh, at Berkeley campus of uh, University of California okay, by Abrahams. They took three groups of children. Okay, the first group has never practiced any meditation and they measure the memory of these people and the memory power is about 40% for those who has never practiced any meditation. And they're all clever students because uh, University of California, Berkeley campus is a well-known university. The second group, they tested their students, okay, in the same class, but they have been practicing meditation for one year. The memory power has gone up to 60%. And the third group, they've been there, they've been practicing for two years, okay, the same class and their memory power has gone up to 70%. So this is very important. Whatever religion you belong to, train your children to learn to pray, to sit quietly, okay? Stop thinking about worldly things, learn to calm the mind all the time. Then the memory will be better, improved, and they can study better, okay? So, when I was a student in England, I was a very naughty boy. I fought everybody. I used to box everybody. I beat everybody because I used Thai kickboxing. I was champion in England outside the ring. Then one day the teacher said, no, you can't do that. You, you've got to box inside the ring using normal practice in, in the country. So I went in there. I was a little bit scared going in the ring for the first time. But my, uh, the person who was going to box me, he came into the ring. When he saw me, he started to shiver, shiver all the time. Now, oh no, if, when we get out of the ring, I'll be kicked by that man. So he got very afraid of me. And uh, so he could not box properly. So I became champion in the ring as well. So I became a very bad boy. I used to fight everybody. I was very angry. I created a lot of noise in the, in the uh, classroom. My teachers didn't like me very much. But then one day, when I was 15 years old, I realized that my future is bleak. 
I was bottom of the class in studies. I did not do well. I could not do anything in the school, except for boxing only. Okay, so I felt that my life will be wasted. Somehow this realization came. Then I started to think what I should do. Then I decided to learn to sit still, calm the mind, train the mind so that it's calm all the time. So I started to practice meditation. And then my life started to change. After three, uh, three months, okay, uh, after only one month, I was practicing every day, about half an hour every day, I became very calm. I stopped boxing. I, start, I stopped hurting other people. I used to smile at everybody. Everybody was so surprised at the change. And after one year of practice, okay, all alone by myself in England, okay, I became top of my class. From bottom, I became top. Why? Because when you start to learn to concentrate your mind, your mind becomes calm, your memory increases, and so you can study better. So I became top of my class. It, everybody was surprised. What has happened? Okay? Well, I continued to practice. I went into the best university, uh, passed the examination with very good marks. So I went uh, into Cambridge, Trinity College, Cambridge. And after two years, I received my bachelor's degree and master's degree because they got me to do a little bit of research. I was to build a little machine that can go on land, travel on land. You can travel on the sea, on the river, in the fields and roads and so on. Anywhere. At that time, there was no such uh, machine. Okay, Nobody has built this before. So I helped the professors to do some research and became successful. So they said, well, you know everything about engineering. You don't need to learn anymore. So they gave me a bachelor's degree after only two years of study. So I went on to London University, Imperial College of Science and Technology, and one day I was sitting in meditation. This picture came into my mind, and I realized this is an amplifier, microwave amplifier. It's, uh, I understood the theory behind it. I understood that nobody has built this before, so I built it, and it worked. So I wrote a big thesis gave it to my professor. My professor was so angry. How come you do your thesis when I have not yet given you permission to do the thesis? So anyway, I said, please, sir, please read it. So he read it, and he was so surprised. It's really a wonderful thesis. So I wrote it, and then I passed the exam very easily. So I got my PhD, the first PhD. Using meditation, I was sitting in meditation, quietly in my mind, and suddenly this picture appeared. So you can see the effectiveness of meditation. You look at great scientists like Sir Isaac Newton. I was very lucky that I had a room when I was at Trinity College. I had a room right next to the room of Sir Isaac Newton. But <laughs> he was there 300 years before me. Anyway, uh, the rooms were built 500 years ago, so I was able to have a room right next to the room of Sir Isaac Newton. And Sir Isaac Newton, when he was a boy, he used to sit alone underneath an apple tree. He did not play like other boys. And when he went to university, he sat underneath an apple tree. Then one day an apple fell down. Suddenly. He realized, oh, I understand. And he understood the law of gravity, the law of motion, and so on. He became a great theory in physics that we all have to learn. Okay, So this is his greatness. He used to sit quietly underneath an apple tree. And he would discover new things all the time. So when I was at Cambridge, I used to go and sit underneath an apple tree. Okay. <laughs> Then I waited and waited and waited, no apple fell down. <laughs> anyway, I learned by using 
silent sitting as well, as, as much as Sir Isaac Newton, I learned many, many new things. Look at Albert Einstein. He did not study well at all when he was in school. Everybody, everybody gave up hope that he will be a good uh, student, okay? So they all said, oh, he has no future at all. Well, he could not get into a university. He went to study at Berlin Technical College, okay? Could not get into university. Okay, he passed and he went through and nobody thought he would be a great scientist. What one day he discovered laws which change the world, okay? Really very important laws. And um, he said to everybody how he came to discover new things. This is, this is his words. He said, intuition is not the result from deliberate intention or program, but comes directly from the heart. Intuition, which is knowledge, suddenly it comes into your mind. It just flicks and there it is. Okay, that's what we call intuition. It comes into your mind by going into your own heart. He said that intuition is not from direct intention or program, not through studies, but comes directly from his own heart. So this is very important, that we all learn to go into our own heart in silence. Then you start to get intuition, knowledge, wisdom. I helped to build this spacecraft. At that time I was professor at University, Chulalongkorn University in Bangkok. And I, every two years I would go to the United States just to find out the latest uh, in science. So I went there to learn something and then come back and continue to teach at Chula Longkorn University. Well, I went there, they announced the project, the Viking spacecraft project. So I applied, when I applied, they said, sorry, we don't accept foreigners. <laughs> so I, I said, okay, never mind. But I then, I then discovered that there were Indians working in NASA, Chinese people working in NASA. How come they could go in there and, and work there? So after a while I discovered that they will accept foreigners on one condition. And that condition is that um, there's no American who can do that job. Or if they do it, they failed. Okay, then they will accept foreigners to replace the Americans. So I looked at the whole project. There's one thing that they could not achieve in the past, and that is a soft landing on other planets. So I applied again. I'm going to help build the automatic landing system for the Viking spacecraft. And uh, so they invited me for an interview. For the interview, there were four other Amer Americans. So. This, they told me, sorry, but you have to wait. We have to choose from the Americans first. If we cannot find a suitable person, then we'll invite you, we'll talk to you. So I said, okay, I'll wait. So I waited. They interviewed all the four Americans. They all, all have a lot of experience. They all have built on spacecrafts. They've worked so on so many things before. But all of them failed when they send the spacecraft onto the surface of any planets in the past. So they came to me and uh, of course I was the only person who have never failed because I have not built anything before. <laughs> so finally they accepted me okay, to work on the project. So I started to work. Okay, Here was I in the laboratories um, all alone, a huge laboratory, all kinds of instruments were available. I was working and working and working for one year and I was quite unsuccessful. I could not achieve any success. So I realized that I'm doing what the Americans are doing, doing a lot of research, doing a lot of experiments and so on. Uh, I said, no, 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 let's use the Eastern way, okay? Not the American way. So I decided to climb up on top of a mountain all alone, okay? I was there sitting all alone by myself for four nights, five days. 
on the fifth day I was practicing I was very calm okay I was practicing meditation I was praying and meditating all through the five days and suddenly I was sitting all alone and somehow it clicked oh I know the answer okay I was so happy I knew how to build this thing okay suddenly it came through intuition not from reading not from studying not from research but from the heart just as Einstein said come from the heart so I went down okay back to the laboratories I built the, the thing gave it to NASA they tested it and they said oh it works it works and they asked me to build three of these things so I built three of these things and then they, they, uh, I said I have to go back because I'm working as a professor at university in Thailand I need to go back quickly okay so they said no you can't go back we'll give you US citizenship immediately <laughs> they want me to stay on I said sorry I I love Thailand I came only to learn from you and then I'll go back and teach so they raised my salary 20 times that time my salary could buy one car okay one American car so I told them I, I don't know what to do with 20 cars per month I don't need it <laughs> so I went I decided to go back they tried to pull me uh, they want me to design a, uh, an aircraft that could, cannot be shot down okay well that would be crazy if I built it for them and the Americans at that time were having a war in Vietnam and they would kill all the Vietnamese North North Vietnamese and they themselves would not be shot so I would not do such a thing so I said sorry I will not do anything that is that will kill people or will hurt people that's not what I'm here to do so I refused everything I went back to Thailand and uh, became continued to work as professor and my salary at that time was 4,500 baht um, which is very little you cannot buy a car you cannot buy motorcycle you cannot buy anything okay but I was happy okay I was teaching children about human values all faculties I used to teach and help many people society and so on so um, let's continue okay um, with the learning process okay well we have seen now how we can teach children we put in positive thinking all the time into the minds of the children through our classes yes we have to teach science yes we have to teach mathematics we want them to be uh, clever people yes but at the same time integrate human values into every subject all the time so you don't need to change the syllabus you don't need to change anything but teachers learn to integrate values get them to think positively all the time to put in positive thinking every morning get up early and then start to tell yourself oh I'm so lucky today I have many problems oh I'm so lucky I will learn from all these problems I will progress I will become successful be happy when you have problems because that's the way we learn you know to be a good mathematician we need to receive a lot of problems in mathematics then we learn from that we start to solve the problems we become very good in mathematics so be happy and when people say bad things at you thank you so much for teaching me a lesson I will learn from you you are my teacher I will learn to control myself I'm so lucky today thank you for swearing at me okay think in a positive way all the time and really it's so useful when people swear at you because you learn self-control okay it's so important and when you have a lot of obstacles in life smile
tell yourself, Oh, I'm so lucky, I have so many obstacles. I will become stronger by learning to climb over these obstacles. I will solve the problems. I will progress in life. Think positively all the time. Then you raise your consciousness higher. Then you find that you start to get knowledge, information. Okay. Then the next thing is to understand that we have uh, another sense. We have the five senses that we, which we use, but we also have the sixth sense. And that sixth sense you can use to change people. You can talk as teachers. You need to in really develop the sixth sense. Okay? Then you can learn to help the children to progress very rapidly. So using the sixth sense, you need to be a real teacher who practices what he teaches. We got to be the real model, okay? The model of whatever we teach. If we tell the children, don't smoke, and then you go behind the, uh, the door and you go and smoke, you cannot be a teacher. You've got to practice what you preach. Otherwise, you will not touch the heart of the children. If you teach children in things that you do not practice, it simply goes to their brain. That's all. It does not transform the children. You've got to learn to practice everything that you teach. You've got to have the human values yourself. You've got to be the example. Then you touch their heart. Okay? So this is very important. And the way to touch the heart is through love. Um, you've got to have a lot of love. You've got to be able to have a lot of compassion because by so doing, you touch the heart of the children. Many people will be coming to visit our school in Thailand in the very near future. And you'll see how loving teachers have to be. And when we love the children, the children love us. All the children, when I walk around, they rush to me, they embrace me, they said, Oh, I love you, teacher. They'll tell me that. And you see that because it's the whole school is full of love. It's very important. So with love and compassion, automatically all of our actions will become right conduct, another value in life. And when you have love and compassion, then you start to have peace. You find a lot of peace. That's another value, very important value. And you raise your consciousness higher. You start to discover the truth about everything. And then when you have all the love and compassion, then you start to have non-violence. You cannot use violence anymore. You can use only good uh, actions, positive action, peace, uh, no, um, not, no violence whatsoever. Okay? So I actually did an experiment in my earlier days with students at um, Chulalongkorn University when I was teaching at that university. I got them to send love to plants. Okay? We grew two plots of plants. Okay? The same thing, it started at two inches tall, then with one plot, uh, the children learn to send love okay, to that plot, but not to the other plot. The other plot is just for comparison. Okay, so we did that experiment and we found that the plants that received love, they grew and grew, they start to have a lot of flowers, whereas the other plant, the, the other plot did not grow as fast. When we measured the results, we found many flowers and they were uh, forty six point two percent taller than the other plot, and the other plot did not have flowers, but if you wait another two weeks, they will start to flower, yes, automatically, okay, so love from parents are so important, love from teachers are so important, everything is very important, so I just want to give you an example from the Satyasai school. first of all, when I set up the school twenty two years ago. I decided that it should be in the countryside. We want to have um, live in the countryside 
So I said we must have a river, we must have a mountain in the area. So those who are going, you can go and practice meditation on the mountain. We have a mountain in the in the school there it is. There's a school building there. Uh, our prayer room is right there and you can climb up on top of the mountain, practice meditation, or you can go in the river, uh, not, not in the water, but uh, by the side of the river, practice your meditation. And here you can see our vision of the Satya Sai School. Create good people above everything else. We don't care about academic. I mean, the, the, the government, they, tells us, they tell us what to teach. Uh, so, yes, we teach according to what they have told us to do, uh, we have to believe in the government, but then we create goodness from these children all the time, okay? And um, uh, the good people, the meaning is simply the emergence of the five human values in their lives. Love, peace, truth, right conduct, nonviolence, okay? These five values should be part of education. So here are the five values, okay, peace, love, right conduct, truth, and nonviolence. And we become a model school now. People come by the thousands every month to visit our school. They come and see how we teach. So we are hoping that most of you will be able to come to our school, see how they are taught, okay, and they're full of peace and full of love. There's no quarreling, no fighting uh, in the school. They solve every problem amongst themselves peacefully all the time. Here are the guests. So many people come and visit our school. So we could not take the burden of uh, accepting all the uh, guests. So we have to limit it to 2,000 guests per month. We cannot take more than that. So you have to queue up, but you already queued up for September. <laughs> okay, you already told us that you're going to come. So that's, that's fine, no problem. Here are the guests, and we get them to meet our children, talk to our children. They see the way we teach children, the guests. And, you know, we learn to be self-sustainable all the time. We grow our own rice, okay? We produce over 30 tons of rice per year, uh, all organic farming, no pesticides, no, uh, nothing, no chemicals, okay? So uh, we grow our own rice, 30 tons is enough for what we need in the school for all the children, 360 children and 50 teachers and 50 staff, so 460 people in the school eating and we need to feed everybody we go out and grow I, I have to lead the way okay so that all the children they all go and grow their rice in the paddy fields and then they also harvest you know the children are always happy smiling all the time we go all kinds of vegetables um, because we are all vegetarian there we don't uh, eat meat so we can grow our own vegetables, all organic farming, okay? So all kinds of vegetables are available, and we produce a lot of it. We use a lot of land to grow all types of vegetables, and in order to help the surrounding, okay, I told all the teachers, use bicycles. No, no cars. <laughs> of course, they need to go long distance, then they have to use cars, but in the school, they got to use bicycles, okay? And we become strong. And we produce our own biodiesel. Uh, all our school cars, our vans, uh, we have a water pumping system, all use biodiesel, okay? Including the tractor, because we need a tractor for our big farm. So uh, it's all produced from vegetable oil used vegetable oil, okay? We collect all this from various hotels uh, in Bangkok. They donate it to us, so it's free. We produce it, so there's no cost and so on, okay? Here are the biodiesel. Um, we have our own solar roof, okay? Using uh, photovoltaic cells or solar cells. We have windmills to produce electricity. 
Okay, we produce all this ourselves, so we try to be self-dependent on everything. Okay, in the school here, the children they build their own their own uh, 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 wind windmills and so on. Okay, uh, we use natural method for drying food because we dry our bananas. Sometimes we have excess of of food, so we dry them. Okay. And we use a greenhouse, okay, the sun goes into the greenhouse, the inside is very hot, okay, about over 70 degrees Celsius, and we can dry bananas, we can dry everything, keep it, we have a hot water system, but we don't use much hot water because it's already very hot, uh, but we have exercising machine, okay, as you exercise, you can uh, produce electricity, Okay, there's a little motor, you can see the motor in front uh, in the machine there and the, the back uh, on the other machine. Here the teachers, they're little, getting a little bit fat, so they have to do more and more exercise. And when they exercise, they turn a motor, a generator, and we produce electricity from the exercising. Okay, so here the children, they build their own bicycles. They turn the motor or dynamo at the back and they produce electricity and we charge batteries and we use the, the electricity at night time for our lighting. So we have a lot of these exercising machine uh, built ourselves. Here is a little solar cell which we turn a little motor and we drop water onto a disc which rotates and we produce a mist and that will cool down the surrounding. We produce our own biogas, okay? Nothing is wasted from the school. When you throw away food and, and so on, okay? Well, you don't waste it. We go and use some fermentation process, produce biogas, and that biogas is then used um, uh, to, uh, for cooking and so on. We can reuse it again, okay? So nothing is wasted. And because our school, we don't collect any fees. Everything is free education, okay? We want to teach children to learn self-sacrifice. And if we charge them a lot of money to learn that, they won't learn, okay? Because we don't give free, so why should they give free? So we have to give free education. We give it to them free of charge, okay? Parents don't have to pay any fees for their education. So they learn to give freely all the time. Now, because we don't charge any money, we don't have any money, okay? So what do we do? Well, we have to learn to be self-sufficient uh, uh, in every way, and at the same time, we reduce carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, cool the place down, and in our case, we decided to build a solar farm. Huge, big farm of solar cells. Produce electricity and we sell this electricity to the electricity generation board, okay? And we get money from it. We earn a lot of money from the solar cells here. And we are using solar cells produced in Singapore, okay? REC, a big company there. Uh, we buy it from them, they use Norwegian technology produced in Singapore and we use it for our school, okay? And we are going to earn quite a bit of money, it's now in production, started to produce electricity now and it's beginning to have some income, but we owe a lot of money because there's a lot of investment to the banks, so we give it to the bank first, then after five years or so it becomes our own profit. Okay, which will help to run the school for 50 more years from now, so I can go and rest <laughs> after that. Okay, so uh, this is the the school. Some parts of the school. There's a river. There's a water system. Uh, here we uh, produce our own drinking water. We produce our own tap water. Okay, all the time, and we have a waste water treatment. Uh, here we use EM as well, uh, you know, where we have EM, EM balls, we throw it in there and clean up the water at the same time. But it's beautiful, everything is beautiful, 
uh, recently Thailand had a, a lot of flooding so we are building raft to show people we can build a house in fact this has now become a house floating house it's got uh, uh, rooms inside there uh, everything here the children are playing on the raft floating and visitors come and see what we do and we do grow vegetables here we grow rice on water you don't need to water the thing it, it takes the water from underneath so we already harvested quite a bit of rice growing on water you don't have to take care of it we grow all kinds of vegetables if we have something that can float okay then we make some holes then we can grow vegetables um, on on the water so we teach people to learn to be self-dependent and very quickly I just want to say that we are all vegetarians in in the school why well if you look at all the famous vegetarians many of them okay like um, I can't see everything Albert Einstein um, Pythagoras Charles Darwin Isaac Newton Leonardo da Vinci Ben uh, Benjamin Franklin uh, you have great people like Mahatma Gandhi they're all vegetarian all famous scientists a vegetarian okay so if you look at the difference between a carnivore and a herbivore here is a carnivore they eat animals okay uh, here's a tiger they also eat animals and you look at uh, the way uh, their, their, their skull okay they have very sharp teeth because they need to bite and kill other animals and the teeth behind is all sharp they don't chew their food they swallow everything okay um, but the cows the horses elephants the strongest animal in the world okay strongest animal okay they're all vegetarian they're herbivores okay and look at their teeth they're like ours okay we chew and chew and chew we need to chew our food well cows they will eat um, they will chew and chew and chew their food all the time and we need to chew and we don't, don't need to kill so we don't need to have sharp teeth okay and our intestines uh, is nine times the length of our body okay all of us and the cows the uh, elephants the horses all vegetarian the herbivores they also also have nine times the length of their body for their intestines okay so but when you look at the carnivores it's only three times the length of their body tigers dogs cats all have only three times the length of their body why because when you eat uh, animal food okay meat after three or four hours it start to go bad so when you eat that it goes bad in your stomach because your stomach is very long ten times or nine times the length of your body it takes at least one and a half days for you to secrete okay so it goes bad inside comes out it smells very badly okay because it goes bad but when you eat vegetarian food it doesn't go bad because it can last for more than one and a half day comes out there's no bad smell and you can digest everything if you eat uh, meat it goes bad inside your stomach okay so you have to take uh, uh, poison you see from your stomach because all through your intestines it will take out food okay and when you look at lifetime uh, the lifespan of people who eat meat only nowadays such people do not exist on earth okay but in the old days Eskimo used to eat meat only they don't have any vegetables at all their lifespan is 27.5 years whereas the hunters in Pakistan the Otomi tribe in Mexico they are vegetarian from birth and they all have a lifespan of over 110 years old okay so if you eat vegetables don't think that you lack all kinds of uh, nu nutrition no you have everything and the main thing is that it suits your stomach it suits the way you eat okay 
and also it helps you to find a lot of peace and joy when you don't kill. When you kill a cow, um, you, you go to a, a place where they kill cows to eat, they cry before they're killed. They start to scream, they're unhappy. <clears throat> they know they're going to be killed and they excrete they, you know, in their system all kinds of uh, negative um, things okay, that comes into the blood and you eat all that and then you start to absorb all the negativity uh, from the animals. So that is the reason why I tell my children to eat only vegetables, no meat. And they all grow and become good people and they all enter university 100%. Okay? They all study at university, now they're practicing, they're working in society, they, they remain vegetarian all through their life. So this is very important okay, as far, as far as food is concerned. Well, I run out of time. I was told to stop at 3.30, right? <laughs> uh, anyway, sometime around here. Uh, so uh, i like to thank um, uh, Kampong, Kampong, what do you call it? Kampong, Kampong Sen Senang. Yeah, Kampong Senang. Oh, I have q and I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. So don't you think that was a fantastic talk? Yes. I th Thank you. Now, I see you wrapped down there, you know, as an audience wrapped with all eyes and ears on Dr. Art Ong, and I'm really truly humbled, and you know, for the richness of what has um, been taught to all of us. So now we'll proceed um, to take questions from the audience. And um, let's have a dialogue with Dr. Art Ong. It's a really very, very, I would call it as very sacred, as well as a very humbling experience for us. It's very, very privileged, you know, for us to have a chance to dialogue with somebody who is as enlightened and as conscious as Dr. Art Ong. So can I please take questions? Just raise your hands and um, our assistants will come to you with the mic. Okay? There you go. That's one, first question there. Can you introduce yourself? Um, can you please bring the mic to her? Yes. Introduce yourself. Any question? Hi, my name is Shanti. Um, I just want to find out, I understand about your school. I just want to see how if a kid goes to a school and studies for a number of years and comes back into, into another country, um, how does it integrate into their education system as well? just want to understand the basis of that. Because Singapore is very um, highly stressed education system. They go for academic results, multiple subjects. So I want to understand how is, if coming back to Singapore system, how they will integrate. Uh, first of all, when you integrate values, you don't need to change the syllabus. Okay? But when you learn to relax, learn to calm the mind, you will study better. Even in a, a system like you have in Singapore where you need to study really hard, so a person who learns to rest the mind, calm the mind, practice meditation, this will go very well and they won't be so stressed. Okay? They'll start to have a lot of concentration, their memory will improve, they'll quickly learn what is being taught and they will not be so stressed. So it's necessary in Singapore to integrate a lot of values, okay? Uh, then you produce good people at the same time. You need better and better people, good people all the time, full of human values. You need a lot of peaceful people all the time they'll find a lot of peace in their life and they'll transmit this to 
other people as well. So the society will benefit uh, and you don't need to change the syllabus. They will learn more quickly if they practice meditation, if they practice uh, concentration of their mind. Okay, so no need to send your children to Thailand to study. It's going to be difficult anyway because uh, we use Thai language. You need to learn Thai language as well. But uh, the government has to bring in human values into the education. Okay, then everything will go smoothly. Is there another question? Before another question emerges, you might be very keen to know, and very happy to know, that Kampong Senang actually runs a Waldorf school for um, very young children, as young as two years old, all, all the way up to kindergarten age, and emphasizing values education. We'll tell you more about that later. Now, can I take another question? This is really a chance of a lifetime. Yes. Hi, my name is Yahui. I'm a teacher in a primary school. I'd just like to find out, uh, you spoke about raising the consciousness of young children. How can we go about doing that? How do we raise the consciousness? Well, uh, I gave you the diagram of the, the learning process. Okay, um, Everything that they see around them, get them to analyze if they can find something good in all these things. And everything is good, okay? Nature is good. Um, everybody, if they swear at you, you say, oh, thank you, because I learned to, to control myself. Uh, you are my teacher, okay? Everything is a teacher. When you uh, slap your hand on the desk, for example, you get hurt. That is action and reaction. Okay, you teach children to observe all these things um, and then after a while they'll be full of values. They'll start to think positively all the time and they'll become calm, steady and they'll study better. Yes, if you can put in some silent sitting, learning to learn to sit silently, quietly, in meditation, then you start to train the mind and become calm, then everything becomes easier. You know, I was a bad student, but when I practiced meditation, I became a very good student. And I learned a lot, very quickly, very fast. Okay, so it's possible to do this when you learn to control the mind. Yes, what a fabulous answer. And can we take another question? We still have about 10 minutes. Yes, please. Gentleman over there. I'm very, very moved by your uh, speech just now. It's really amazing. Um, actually, I just want to, I don't have a question actually. I just want to tell everybody that I'm a, I'm a meditator. I teach meditation free of charge. So, yeah. I sponsor my own classes. So anybody who is interested, I've always wanted to conduct meditation in schools in Singapore, but don't know how to go about doing it. So if you're interested, let me know. My teacher is an um, enlightened master by the name of Sri Chin Moy. Just two days ago, his statue was in the newspaper about the flood in um, Prague. So there was a statue and he was in a, it was flooded. So um, that was my teacher, Sri Chin Moy. He teaches meditation at the United Nations for 37 years. And I learned meditation with him for 24 years. And I give meditation free of charge. So um, if you're interested, just let me know. My name is Yap Tian Bing. Um, yeah. That's all I want to say. Thank you, Mr. Yap, for your generous offering. Yes, that's the spirit that, that I'm sure Dr. Art Ong wants to inspire in all of us. The spirit of self-sacrifice, right? Um, may I have another question? 
Yes, please, George. Thank you. Uh, what about the schools around your school? Do you have any interaction with them? Do, are the practices at your school spreading to other schools? Well, we have trained some 100,000 teachers in Thailand, okay, um, giving actual training. But we have uh, about 700,000 <laughs> so one in seven of all the teachers in Thailand have been trained. But, you know, after a year or so, some have retired and new teachers have come in. So it's a, a very long process and we need cooperation from the government. So some government say yes, train them. Some government said no, so okay, we, we cannot train. So we are actually training many uh, teachers from all over the world. In fact, many Singaporeans have gone to stay in our school okay, for two and a half months. They're trained into becoming good teachers. We train teachers from everywhere throughout the world okay, in English. So, uh, so they have special courses lasting two and a half months. And they stay, stay with our children. They learn from our children a lot. So we are trying to do this. Uh, I also go around and train teachers, giving talks, lectures all over Thailand and all over the world uh, to help everybody uh, to think about this, okay? Think about human values, education. So this is being done and um, it has to be done all over the place. So I come to Singapore a few times already uh, and I'll be going to uh, all the countries in ASEAN as well. And we're going to start up, set up a new Satya Sai school in Laos, okay, as part of our uh, contribution to ASEAN. And uh, we're going to be, we already set up schools in Malaysia, help in Malaysia, and also in uh, the Philippines, and two in Indonesia. So we're not staying still, we're working hard for the whole world. That's really very fantastic to hear, isn't it? Let's give him a really, you know, big round of applause for the encouragement, all right? To encourage Dr. Art Ong in his um, right action and his generosity. Um, can I please take one last question? Yes. Um, Dr. Art Ong, thank you for your sharing. Um, I just want to ask you, do you have any experience with kids who are special needs like um, ADHD or autism or Down syndrome um, and the, you know, the various categories of kids? Um, <clears throat> in our school, we don't select children. Children we can teach. But we have to have some kind of selection because uh, you know, we have about 700 applicants every year and we can only ex accept 30 children. So, uh, 30 from 700. So we do need to have some selection. So since we feel that children can be taught, we don't select children, but parents are difficult to teach, so we have to select parents. <laughs> parents come for an examination. <laughs> uh, the, you know, the children, they also come and they play around, they're so happy, you know, they don't have to take a test, but parents are very serious, you know. They, <laughs> they are, anyway, we, we do that. So the result is that because we don't select children, some of them have a lot of uh, problems, okay, but after some time, uh, for example, one child, um, you know, you, you cannot teach that child at all. What, what do you call it? Um, uh, where she's, she just doesn't have any concentration, okay? Uh, I, you mentioned, uh, you, you, autistic, autistic child, yes, autism. So a child has autism, she, uh, he, okay, he came to our school. At first we cannot teach. 
We cannot teach anything. The mind is not with the teacher, not with herself or himself, but thinking about something else. So after a while I have to have one teacher for one child. And that makes it very difficult because we don't have so many teachers. But we learned a lot by accepting this child. That this child, even though he has autism, yet the subject that he likes, he will have that concentration. Well, we discovered that he likes to eat only one thing, okay, and that is instant, instant noodle. <clears throat> we cannot give anything else. You know, we cannot give him vegetables, we cannot give anything, he won't eat. And he'll just remain ang uh, hungry all the time, you know. So what we did was we started with instant noodles, but then we mix vegetables into it, okay, without him knowing about it. You know, he doesn't know. So he continues to eat and we add more and more vegetables and then after um, a month or so, we can start giving vegetables and he will eat, okay? So um, problems start to change. We have to start with what the child loves the most. Autistic children, sometimes they're very good artists. So we've got to start with, with art. Get them to be interested in that and then gradually we work with them by integrating new things and help them to learn more and more. After one year, he became a normal child. Okay, through this practice, it's a lot of work. One teacher for, for one child. Okay, so yes, we do accept children, but not so many. We cannot afford to to concentrate on uh, children who have problems. Well, we have normal problems, problems where they're violent, they will quarrel, they will fight. But after only one month or so, they become peaceful because of the practice that we do regularly, every day, every day, and uh, integrating values. So children with problems like that, we can help and we find that after only one month, they become very peaceful. They change completely. Aggressiveness will disappear and instead you start to have human values. Okay? Uh, we have not taken cases where um, uh, they have a lot of difficulties uh, as yet. Okay? So that we have not done. Um, but we are willing to take one or two, no more than that, okay? every, every year. And we do have uh, attention deficit children, we have problems like that, but we train them. Okay, after a while, they become more and more normal person and they can study quite well. Okay, so that's the way we, we do. We, we, we are not expert in this. We're still learning. Thank you, Dr. Arthur.